What happens when thousands of rats are left alone on a small island? For many centuries, roughly halfway between New Zealand and the Antarctic, Macquarie Island was mostly isolated, leaving its land pristine and untouched by foreign animals. A land where penguins and seals and even plants grew undisturbed. It was the advent of ships with rats hidden in their hull and stores that first offset the gentle balance of the native ecosystem. Uninvited and ravenous stowaways on 19th century ships, these creatures caused the collapse of the fragile ecosystem of Macquarie Island. As a result, humans thought the next solution was to bring in cats to solve their rat problem, not understanding that this would cause even more harm to the ecosystem. Beautiful birds vanished, the soil began to crumble, and scientists alarmingly realized that collapse was imminent on Macquarie Island. This is the story of how a far away isolated island became derelict and the efforts over decades to restore the glory of its ecosystem. A lot of people knew absolutely nothing about Macquarie Island in the 1800s, and some that did know probably thought it was just a bleak, empty island. But that couldn't have been further from the truth. Now, even though the island looks bare, it holds one of the most delicately balanced ecosystems on Earth. Everything that lived there had adapted to being alone, and for thousands of years, that's exactly what kept the place thriving. Each year, millions of seabirds made their way across the ocean to breed there. Among them were four different types of penguins, and we're including the island's very own royal penguin. Amazingly, it's not known to nest anywhere else on the planet, and it wasn't just penguins. Southern elephant seals and fur seals hauled themselves onto the beaches too. Their presence did more than mark the season. They fertilized the soil with waste and nutrients too. That means they helped local plants thrive. But what really made the island's ecosystem work was how simple it was. Birds nested freely on the ground, plants grew without being eaten, and invertebrates thrived beneath untouched soil. It's safe to say that was a closed, self-regulating system. Despite its stability, it was also extremely vulnerable. That vulnerability didn't matter for a long time. Well, until the end of the 19th century. Humans started arriving at the island with boats, equipment, and other related stuff, but unknown to them, there were animals they didn't even know would become a problem. Rats, mice, cats, and rabbits weren't part of the plan, but once they arrived, they found an ecosystem wide open to destruction. The damage began slowly, but it soon picked up the pace, and when it did, Macquarie's balance started slipping away. Now to clarify, the animal invasion didn't start with an explosion. There weren't any ash clouds or even tremors, but there were lots of tiny paws and twitching noses. Frederick Hasselborough, an Australian explorer, discovered the island in 1810 and realized its untouched ecosystem was perfect for hunting prey. At the time, he was interested more in marine life, as sealing was a booming industry then. Fur seals' hide provided valuable materials for luxury clothes and hats. Elephant seal oil was in high demand for commercial lighting and lubrication purposes. Even the king penguin wasn't spared. With leaner animal protection laws than the ones we have in the 21st century, several explorers and hunters followed Frederick Hasselborough's footsteps. Thus, there was a continuous arrival of ships and the establishment of semi-permanent human settlements by sealers. Somewhere in the mid-1800s, rats and mice slipped ashore on Macquarie Island. It's almost certain that they came when people arrived, although they were probably tucked away in the holds of sealing and supply ships. Nobody gave them a second thought, after all, they were just rodents. What started off looking harmless slowly began to unravel the island's entire ecosystem. Black rats were the first to show up, and they settled in fast. With no predators and loads of food, their numbers took off. Then the damage began. At night, they crept into seabird colonies, sneaking into burrows to steal eggs, kill chicks, and sometimes even attack adult birds. 
the Blue Petrel, Antarctic Prion, and Diving Petrel had safely raised their young underground for thousands of years, but now they never stood a chance. These birds had no survival instincts whatsoever to help them fight back. And why would they? They had never needed them until now, and it was too late. And then there were the mice. They might seem small, but the damage they caused was anything but. At first, they fed on seeds, roots, and insects. But when winter rolled in and food became harder to find, they didn't hesitate to adapt. It was quite scary. They gnawed at live chicks and even scavenged in bird colonies. Their numbers shot up as the weather got warmer, and with climate change speeding things along, those booms started happening more and more often. By chomping through seeds and seedlings, they didn't just slow down native plant growth. In some spots, they stopped it completely. Plants like cushion plants, mosses, and other low-lying greenery just couldn't grow back fast enough to keep up. In addition, their constant burrowing disrupted delicate soil systems, displacing insects, and wrecking entire invertebrate communities. Sadly, nothing was done for decades. The island was too remote. The science just wasn't there yet. But by the late 20th century, researchers started connecting the dots. Rodents weren't just stealing eggs. They were holding back the island's entire recovery. Bird populations kept shrinking. Vegetation stayed patchy. And then came the next big mistake. To solve the rat and mouse problem, humans brought in cats. It seemed quite a logical move. Cats eat rats, right? But instead of restoring balance, the cats set off an entirely new wave of destruction. Back then, it sounded reasonable enough. Cats hunt rodents. Problem solved, right? Not even close. Once let loose, these cats didn't just survive. They thrived. No predators, plenty of food, and endless open space meant they spread fast. By the 1970s, it's estimated that around 2,500 feral cats roamed the island. And while they did catch rats and mice, they quickly found an easier target, the seabirds. The cats hunted with absolute precision. At night, they'd stalk the island's ground-nesting and burrow-nesting birds. There were species like the blue petrel, white-headed petrel, and prions. These birds had spent thousands of years nesting without ever needing to look over their shoulders. They didn't run or hide because they simply weren't built to deal with predators on land. The result? Entire colonies were torn apart nest by nest. By the 1980s, the numbers were hard to ignore. Researchers believed cats were killing up to 60,000 seabirds every year. That kind of pressure wasn't just cutting down bird populations. It was pushing some species right to the edge of disappearing from the island. And the damage didn't stop there. The cats threw off the entire ecosystem. They had to go. So in the 1980s, the first serious control efforts began. Those efforts were poisoning, trapping, and shooting. It was really slow, super expensive, and very complicated. Fortunately, by 2000, the job was done. Every last feral cat had been removed. Macquarie was officially cat-free, making it the site of the most successful cat eradication on a sub-Antarctic island at the time. But success came with a twist. Without cats, the island's rabbits, who were once kept somewhat in check by feline predators, were free to roam. It was a clear example of what happens when one species is removed without dealing with the rest. The cats had been a problem, no doubt. However, they were also the only thing slowing the rabbits down. Now, nothing stood in their way, and they didn't waste time. Almost immediately, the rabbit population exploded, launching a fresh wave of destruction that was much worse. So what started as an attempt to fix one problem had just created a whole chain reaction. Macquarie Island wasn't just dealing with pests anymore. The entire ecology of the island was at stake. These weren't accidental stowaways. Back in 1879, sealers brought them in on purpose as an emergency food source in case they got stranded. Nobody imagined they'd become a long-term threat. For decades, the rabbits didn't seem like a huge issue. Then the cats were gone. And just like that, the balance tipped. With no predators around to keep them in check, the rabbit population exploded. At one point, over 100,000 rabbits roamed Macquarie. 
They literally took over the island. To demonstrate, they went after everything green. Grasses, mosses, and slow-growing cushion plants were stripped to the roots. Plants that had taken centuries to grow in Macquarie's cold, wet climate were flattened in months. One of the worst hit was Azarella macquariensis, a cushion plant that held down the soil and sheltered bird nests. Once it was gone, the land couldn't hold itself together anymore. Consequently, hillsides started collapsing. Even seals and penguins lost their sheltered breeding grounds as the terrain gave way beneath them. And it wasn't just surface level. Beneath the ground, rabbits were also tearing things up, disturbing invertebrate populations, breaking up soil structures, and throwing off the entire nutrient cycle. In some areas, the damage was so bad that the land became completely barren. By the 1980s, the warning signs couldn't be ignored, and people tried to step in. In the 1970s and 80s, scientists introduced myxomatosis, a viral disease that had worked in mainland Australia. It wasn't very successful because of the climate. In the 1990s, they tried again with RHDV, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus. The success didn't last long either. The rabbits either developed resistance or bounced back stronger after each outbreak. The island would start to recover then crash again. And every time the population dipped and returned, the island's fragile ecosystem was whiplashed all over again. Now, there were some limited shooting and baiting programs that followed. It became a really frustrating cycle. Unlike rats or cats, which attacked selectively, rabbits transformed entire landscapes. Every season they bred, the destruction spread. The ecosystem simply couldn't keep up. Macquarie Island, once a carefully balanced ecosystem, was in serious trouble. By the early 2000s, one thing was clear. There was no room for half measures. Seabird numbers were dropping fast, hillsides were eroding, and native plants, some of which took decades just to grow a few centimeters, were disappearing under the pressure of the damage left behind by rats and cats. Rabbits had also turned a fragile island into a ticking time bomb. If anything was going to survive, birds, plants, soil, basically the whole system, it was going to take more than a virus. It was going to take a full-scale, island-wide intervention. And that's exactly what came next. Thankfully, scientists and conservationists had already started looking for answers. Some efforts dated back to the mid-1900s, but most were small and scattered. A trap here, a poison bait there. Nothing that could actually turn the tide. But they counted for something. They taught researchers what didn't work, and more importantly, what might work if done on a larger scale. The only way forward was to remove all the invaders completely. No more isolated attempts. The entire island needed serious help, and it had to happen all at once. The year 2010 saw Macquarie Island witness the stage for a mission like no other. The Macquarie Island Pest Eradication Project, MIPEP. It launched officially in 2007. The goal? Total removal of all the rabbits, rats, and mice on the island. No exceptions, no halfway marks. Funded by the Tasmanian and Australian governments, the exercise took precision, patience, and millions of dollars. Aerial baiting was the first stage. Helicopters equipped with GPS systems blanketed the island with specially designed poison in 2010 and 2011. Through freezing weather and difficult storms, pilots flew to cover the entire island terrain. The going was tough. Frozen mud, incessant storms, and what seemed like endless miles of uncompromising landscape. But missing even a single surviving rat or rabbit could undo everything that had been accomplished. The effort paid off. By 2014, after five years and $24 million, Macquarie Island was officially pest-free. The transformation was swift. Plants began to regrow, birds returned, an ecosystem once pushed to the brink became a beacon of hope, a reminder that even the most damaged places can heal if we're willing to fight for them. The helicopters played their part, but let's be honest, the real stars of the operation were the dogs. Once the aerial baiting was done, the hardest task was still ahead, making sure not a single invader was left. On an island like Macquarie, even one pregnant rat could undo years of effort. So between 2011 and 2014, 
teams of sharp-nosed terriers and their handlers scoured every boggy hillside and icy slope. These weren't your average house pets. They were elite detection units, trained to sniff out a single rabbit dropping in a thousand acres of tundra. For such an important job, the team had to be selective about what breeds they worked with, generally favoring Springer Spaniels, Labradors, and certain Terriers. These dogs were at the top of the pack because of their ability to sniff out rabbits and endure Macquarie Island's cold and wet climate. Even with those biological advantages, the selected canines still had to undergo vigorous scent training to complete their task. This often started in controlled environments, where the target odor was presented and the dog was immediately rewarded for indicating its presence. Handlers also had to make the training process progressively difficult, ensuring that the sniffer dogs could work under the most intense conditions, come wind or rain. It was like taking the dog's natural sense of smell and multiplying it by 10. With the intense training sessions complete, the dogs and their handlers covered every inch of the island and checked holes, burrows, and ice patches for surviving predators. Conditions were brutal. Teams lived in remote camps, battling blowing snows while slowly searching and researching each conceivable hiding spot. It's essential to also note that these dogs weren't trained killers. Rather than setting off another chain reaction due to unchecked predators, the team only brought in their four-legged sniffers to detect rabbits. Once a handler was able to locate the invading species, they dispatched the rabbit with other methods like shooting or burrow fumigation. This search and confirm was incredibly intense as even one wrong move could restart the invasion. They got it right though. Although the baiting ended in 2011, it took several more years of careful monitoring before Macquarie Island was officially declared pest-free in 2014. The proof was in the rebound, which was ragged up cushion plants began to grow anew and blue petrels and gray petrels who hadn't been spotted in decades came back to nest. Even soil and moss animals reclaimed their territory. Macquarie's revival was a conservation miracle showing the power of what can be done with science, determination, and some great canine companions. But it came with a cost, and even now every ship arriving is rigorously screened. Sniffer dogs patrol before ships even leave port. No one's leaving anything to chance after this bitter conflict. With a second chance given, the island is now being guarded like treasure. The lesson? Nature rebounds when we leave it alone, but only if we clean up our own mess completely first. But the story doesn't end in 2014. Since the official pest-free declaration, Macquarie Island has become a living laboratory for ecological restoration. Scientists now monitor everything from soil recovery rates to bird nesting success, and the changes have been remarkable. Petrol burrows, once abandoned, are now active again with chicks hatching in places that hadn't seen a single egg in decades. Azarella macquariensis, the cushion plant once feared nearly extinct, has shown signs of stabilizing, though it remains critically endangered and under constant watch. To prevent history from repeating itself, Macquarie is now under one of the strictest biosecurity regimes in the world. Every supply crate, boot sole, and piece of clothing headed to the island is inspected, scrubbed, and cleared of soil, seeds, and pests. Even scientific equipment undergoes sterilization. No rats, no rabbits, no exceptions. And the success of Macquarie is setting a precedent. Conservationists worldwide now cite it as proof that large-scale island restoration is possible even in the harshest environments. Similar efforts are underway in New Zealand, the Galapagos, and subantarctic South Georgia. Some even call Macquarie a blueprint for saving biodiversity. This once devastated island is now a beacon, not just of recovery, but of how quickly nature rebounds when given a fighting chance. And it reminds us, if we're bold enough to reverse the damage, ecosystems can come back stronger than ever. This isn't just about one far off island, it's a masterclass in restoring ecosystems. Macquarie taught us that even the most decimated environments will heal when we commit fully to solutions, trust the science, and appreciate the working dogs who do the jobs humans can't. What do you think about the restoration efforts done on the island? Leave your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button for more updates like this.